Hello, everyone. You're all very, very welcome. Thank you for coming to our last uh, session of the day. And uh, we want to have as much interaction from you as possible throughout this session. So a couple of times during the coming hour, I will ask for the lights to be raised and I'll ask for your hands to go up right up. I hear have to be and stand up and we'll get your questions because we have Raggy Omar with us, and I have a lot of questions for him, and no doubt you do too. Uh, he's a very familiar face uh, to us for many, many years. Such an interesting career, so many places that you have covered and reported from. So we're going to learn a little bit uh, about the passion and the experiences and the inspirations, and I feel his story will inspire many of you um, to think about some of the potential paths uh, to what Raggy does. Um, my name is Nuala McGovern. I'm a presenter on the BBC World Service and also BBC World News. And in odd time, I will go out on the field as well, but not, really? not to places as hostile, I think is probably fair to say, as you do. And he's also had this wonderful career that has spanned between uh, the BBC and also then to uh, Al Jazeera, but ITN from 2013, Correct. where he works and where you will see him many evenings. But as I began looking through your career, I was like, oh, he's done documentaries. Yeah. Oh, he's done those reports. Oh, he's done the news presenting. So you're very lucky to have the next hour to hear how that has evolved and what his journey has been. So let's make the most of it and let us begin. All right. Uh, now inter international affairs editor, I should say, at ITV News. Um, let's go back. Okay. What made you want to get into journalism? Uh, I grew up in, uh, I was born in Somalia. Um, I lived there until I was about six years old and my father's um, was uh, part of the independence movement in East Africa and a lot of his, uh, um, uh, he decided to go into business rather than politics that a lot of people in the independence era, post-colonial Africa, decided to go into. So a lot of his business was taking him to the UK. Um, so he decided to sort of bring his family over here and, um, uh, you know, put myself and my siblings through sort of uh, education here. But basically, so he left. He was a first-generation immigrant. And I had lots of uncles and aunts and, uh, you know, um, uh, other relatives that was just sort of scattered in the four corners of the world, um, in Middle East, uh, Africa, <laughs> uh, South Asia, everywhere, either studying or trying to make a living. So I grew up in a family that around our kitchen table, we would just discuss um, what was happening in the world. So that was my window on terms of, one of being interested in international news. The first sort of memory I have was just... Um, uh, hearing stories about uh, relatives that were so we you know grew up talking about sort of apartheid South Africa and you know Nelson Mandela and uh, you know the you know uh, revolutions in the in the Middle East and I mean I didn't have any opinion about it but I was just listening you know and I just thought gosh I'd really like something that allows me to experience that I mean that was that was the beginning but it took a long time for that for me to realize that journalism was actually one way to sort of uh, explore the world. And, and did you have other journalists in your family? None, uh, absolutely none. So I'd, I'd sort of say that, uh, I mean, uh, as far away that when I sort of started to, when, when all of you may be thinking about it, um, the one thing I could sort of say that is true is that don't, don't be put off if you don't uh, have any, you know, friends or family or relatives, because I know that I'm sure we'll get into it, that journalism is very hard to get into if you don't, it's not like, you know, if, if you want to be a lawyer, you have to have a law degree, yes. or, you know, if you want to be a, a, a doctor, you have to have sort of, you know, but in journalism, it's, it's slightly still a very opaque um, uh, calling, I think, yeah. more than a profession. So uh, that's, no, I didn't, I didn't have any relevance. So, well, let's talk about how yeah. you managed to get the foot, yeah. elbow, knee in <laughs> okay. that door. Uh, where did you start? Uh, well, <laughs> I, um, I, at university, I didn't do any student journalism because uh, it seemed to me very cliquey. And I thought university was just much more about sort of trying to just have fun and... Uh, um, people just skills. People skills, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, and I sort of by the end I said, actually, I quite like this idea of journalism. So um, uh, I left and um, obviously lots of other sort of um, people had sort of edited the student paper or gone into, you know, um, hospital radio and I hadn't had any of that and then I what remember what did you study I, I did history so I suppose I was, you know that's somewhere in the ballpark but not really um the most 
relevant thing I ever did, more than a degree, was learning to touch type. <laughs> uh, I sort of put myself through, I thought, okay, deadlines, that means you have to write a story fast. A uh, history degree has done absolutely nothing <laughs> apart from sort of knowing where certain countries are in the world geographically. But uh, I went and did a, a typing course, best thing I ever did, really. I mean, um, what, the other thing I'd sort of say is that um, journalism, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you sort of, you know, um, will have thought about, you know, media studies, journalism degrees and so forth. It still is incredibly practical. I mean, it's, it's ultimately, it's about meeting deadlines. It's about sort of editing pictures. It's making sure, you know, there can never be uh, a blank hole in a newspaper, a magazine, a podcast, whatever else. So just being able to just meet those sort of deadlines. And I thought, I can't have the luxury of doing, you know, a week's essay crisis at university. <laughs> so, uh, when's the deadline? Nine o'clock. I might get it to you tomorrow morning. So um, <laughs> actually, so, but um, uh, how I got my foot in the door was uh, <laughs> um, the Financial Times, I think they still do, they have a, a graduate uh, scheme. And they said, write an article that you think would be relevant to a Financial Times audience. Um, so Financial Times, you know, it's very sort of business, you know, um, in, international investment orientated. It's not like writing for the Times or, you know, where you just write a general article. It's a very specific uh, audience. So they wanted to sort of sort out the people who thought, hey, I just want to be a foreign correspondent, you know. So. Um, it was after the first Gulf War. None of you would have been alive at all. You wouldn't have been even a twinkling in your parents' eyes. But uh, <laughs> the first Gulf War, and uh, sort of some ways, and similar to the second Gulf War, which I suppose none of you were even alive for then. But um, so, uh, you know, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and the Americans and other international allies form a military coalition to eject Saddam Hussein. And uh, I thought, well, it'd be really interesting what happens to the main oil producing um, coalition, you know, uh, OPEC, the, the sort of organization of petroleum exporting countries, which is kind of a, a group of countries that uh, sell uh, oil to most of the world's markets, because Kuwait was an important member. So <laughs> I was, I phoned up the OPEC ambassador in London, and I told something that was technically true, which was, uh, hello, I'm writing an article for the Financial Times. Um, and I didn't sort of tell him it was, a, it was for a graduate trainee scheme. So um, I just heard him in the back of the voice saying, clear my diary, the Financial Times is interviewing me. You know, what am I doing? And when do you want to meet me? I said, well, whenever suits you, I will meet you anywhere, anytime. So I, I got this interview with the ambassador and I wrote this article and uh, the Financial Times, purely on the basis of that, decided to invite me for an interview. That's um, great. So, uh, and they said, that was really clever. How did you do that? And I said, well, I'm writing an article for you. Ah, oh, okay. So, uh, so I was hustling yeah. to answer you shortly. And I, I don't know whether the hustle ever ends. No, it doesn't, <laughs> no. And uh, I think you, that is the other thing about sort of um, wanting to be a, a sort of a, a, a correspondence in any field, not just internationally. It could be politics, it could be sports, it could be you know, business, it could be whatever it is. I think just um, never, um, uh, never sort of tire of, you know, trying to find what it is that you have a head start on. Um, I mean, in fact, I mean, one of the things I sort of wanted to sort of show you in, in a short while is, um, I'm, as I said to you earlier, I'm sort of from Somalia. And uh, about three, four years ago, uh, the United Nations said that, um, that it was facing or preparing for one of the largest um, uh, humanitarian crises in the UN sort of history, where they thought that there were four countries simultaneously that were in danger of facing the threat of famine. So one was the whole of the Somali uh, region, Yemen, uh, South Sudan, and Northern uh, Nigeria. And they said that the United Nations had never had to make an appeal for uh, famine in more than I think two countries at the same time, but four consecutively at the same time, some man-made, some natural. Um, and uh, I went back to Somaliland, which is where my sort of uh, family originally from. Uh, I still have relatives sort of uh, living there. Um, and it was slightly sort of odd because I was sort of going home. I, sp I still, I speak the language. Um, and I went back and, and one of the things I'd sort of say is that, I mean, if, if you're interested in journalism, all of us come from, particular backgrounds, we have particular interests. And I think we should never be afraid for 
going back to tell the story about where we, you know, that might be rooted in where we sort of uh, came from. Because uh, it does help you if you've got a head advantage. Oh, you talk about sort of, you know, hustling. It's obviously in this context, it's more than sort of uh, hustling. But here was a situation I said, well, look, I can't go to Somalia because southern Somalia is too dangerous. Yemen was uh, in a state of war. Where can I most tell the story where I have a head advantage? And uh, this is the piece I sort of did for the ITV News. Let's watch. In a land scorched dry by three years of failed rains, the barren earth that should be growing crops has been turned to dust. This dust used to be the fertile soil these communities once farmed to feed themselves. Now they try to hide from it, taking shelter from sandstorms in trees that provide no protection. Asha said she'd been left with nothing. I lost two baby daughters to the drought, she told me. My husband lies sick at home, unable to get up. I've come here for help. This is the help Asha and so many others have come here for, life-giving water. This is where the aid is most needed, in some of the remotest parts of Somaliland, to communities who are not only vulnerable, but living in the harshest of conditions. In the midst of nature's awesome power and cruelty, this is what coming to people's aid looks like. The water's been trucked in over hundreds of miles, made possible by the donations of British people who responded to the DEC's emergency appeal. The relief and hope it gives where there was once none is etched into people's faces. Ahmed Adam Mohammed is head of operations for the UK charity ActionAid. He told me the aid had kept many alive, but there was still a long way to go. That aid has actually saved the lives of many people who have actually been dead by today as we speak. But then it doesn't mean that it has already completely been alleviated. So the crisis isn't over? It's not over. We travelled further into eastern Somaliland. Getting aid to such regions is no easy task, but these are the communities who need it most. Nomadic settlements relied on their herds for income and food, but they've lost almost 90% of their animals to the drought. These supplies from UK agencies, flour, rice, cooking oil and sugar, is what feeds them now. Asha Haji Farah's family is one of 500 here that get 25 kilos of supplies every month. The reality, however, is that it doesn't just feed them. There are others arriving all the time. And so the supplies that she carries to her home and which is meant just for them is shared with several other families. It's the same for everyone else. She told me that her message to the people in Britain is, thanks to you, this food has helped us so much. But still, there are many who are in need. We need your help. This aid, bought with British public donations and now beginning to be delivered in these remote regions of Somaliland, is a lifeline that arrived just in time to avert famine. It doesn't mean that the threat has gone and people are still dying from diseases associated with malnutrition. If the rains fail again in the coming months, millions more will be at risk and in need of more assistance that only this kind of lifeline can give. Ragi Omar, News at 10, Eastern Somalia. Thanks, Ragi. It's, um, the story is heartbreaking, but it's mm. visually really arresting yeah. with the colours. Mm. Was that something you were thinking about as yeah. you were trying to tell the story? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I think the other thing is um, two things. Uh, first of all, I think stories are always about access, aren't they? So my earlier point about, you know, what is it that you're interested in? Where is it that you've grown up? What is it that you've sort of, that always, there are stories to be found sort of everywhere. I mean, in that sense, that was, you know, the UN makes an appeal. It's from, you know, a period of a place in the world that you know very well and have access. So that, that helped. But also, I think um, the other thing is you always have to think practically when you're telling a story uh, as heartbreaking and as, you know, moving and as uh, dangerous as things are. You're always thinking, what should we film? You know, what should we sort of do? It, you just have to, you go, it's, a, it's, I'm afraid to say, it sounds sort of quite 
It doesn't sound callous, but it's just, you're thinking, that, you know, when, when the sandstorm came, we just thought, okay, we have to sort of stay here. The cameraman has to sort of go. It doesn't matter how difficult it was. Um, uh, and as you rightly said, you know, the, 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 the colors of, you know, the saris that the women were sort of wearing against this sort of parched, dry sort of landscape communicate something very powerful back home. So, you know, uh, you may be making calculations that you think, okay, I'm thinking very practically here. This is amazing pictures. This is going to really sort of help us get more time on the news and so forth. But that's what it takes to, on the basis of that, I mean, you know, the DEC launched an appeal and raised 53 million pounds, you know, uh, so. Um, it had impact. It had impact. So even when you're, when you're on the ground, of course you empathize and you have to, and you have to tell people sort of stories, but at the same time you have to think, how can I make this story you know, um, come to life in a way that people can relate to. You know, who knows, who here knows anything about Somaliland or the drought? No, no one. But you don't need much to sort of I feel a story like that. And there were some words. I mean, obviously, if somebody is British, when sure, a woman in yeah, Somaliland yeah, says, yeah, 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 you know, yeah, I want to thank them, but your ears will but, but the thing is, up. I mean, that's what I sort of thought, because, I mean, uh, I, I, I knew that, uh, um, you know, and again, that's the whole point about sort of, access, being able to talk to that woman in sort of in, you know, uh, in, in Somali, you know, I said, what do you think? You know, do you know anything about Britain? She had, you know, she said, look, I've heard of it. Um, I, I don't know who sort of brought this, but I know it's from Britain. Um, she didn't know who ActionAid was. So it was not an advert, if you like, for ActionAid, but she just thought some people, and also I think it works the other way. I think we, we get quite cynical about what we, as a community, as, a, as an individual, as a country, as a community, whatever we can do in the yes. world. But then sometimes when you see something, you say, actually, you know, I've given a pound or 10 pounds or 50 pounds, whatever it is, and here's a person who, you know, at least for the next week has got some sustenance out of it. So that was my other sort of thing is, uh, you know, you know, how you edit a piece. <laughs> and I know that within the, we both, you know, worked at the BBC and uh, you must sort of just tell the story straight. But, um, you know, you have to fight against, I think, you know, cynicism, uh, you know, um, disconnection and cynicism. I think that's what journalism is there to do as the fifth estate to say, well, there's a big world out there. You're, you know, somehow connected to it. Here's a small, here's a small piece, you know, that, uh, there are people the other side of the world that are in a very sort of, you know, poor, threatened, vulnerable, you know, uh, scenario. Uh, the UK gives, you know, uh, certain, you know huge amounts of uh, uh, aid uh, to people. Here's what your money does. And there is also, I think you'd agree, a hunger for some positivity. No, I think so, yeah. Within yeah, I think stories, that's very which I, I think, think very true, yeah. that comes through yes. in that piece as well. Obviously, the larger context is not, mm. but at least no, we I think get you're a right, yeah. uh, that I think mm. probably why we connect mm. with it as well. Um, but we, you've also gone to many uh, more hostile yeah. places. Mm. Uh, Gaza is one which I think, mm. you know, anybody who's read the news will always have seen it over the mm. past few decades. And I think... Um, just been a hot spot for mm. so long and, and flares up every now and again. Um, with working in dangerous places, which I think particularly if people have an interest in reporting uh, from yeah. conflict-ridden zones, what do you think is the one thing perhaps that people don't realise? I think people don't realise that um, when you, you know, switch on the news or flip open your computer or your iPad and you're looking at wherever it is, you know, Syria today, um, uh, wherever, you know, Gaza yesterday, that uh, whoever it is, you know, it might be, you know, Lindsay Hilsom or Jeremy Bowen or Christian Amanpour, they just pop up miraculously and they sort of, you know, um, they're this kind of wandering lost tribe that just appears in the later sort of place. Uh, and that's how, you know, somehow that they're known, you know, that, you know, uh, you, you, you work for this international news organization uh, you arrive in a in a you know a war zone that is particularly on the international agenda. There's many others that aren't, and you just start reporting. You know nothing could be further from the truth. And every time you do switch on the TV and you see anybody reporting, there is they're only there. They're safe. They're able to operate. They're able to have a place to stay the night, have fuel, have a generator that that, that fuel powers that allows them to edit material and send it abroad simply because they have what we call quote unquote fixers who are Syrians, Iraqis, Gazans, uh, Rohingya, you know, Muslims who 
are journalists themselves who work as a sort of local production staff that supports these international news crews. Um, without that, we'd literally, you know, to quote our prime minister, be dead in a ditch, you know, quite <laughs> literally. Um, so, I mean, I've, wherever I've been in the world, uh, 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 they have been, I, I, I sort of describe them as our guardian angels because, yes. you know, they're known as well. They're, they're known. They're, they're, you know, they, they, they know, you know, there are lots of times when I've sort of said, let's go to X. And whoever I'm working with, um, it might be Riyadh, who are about to see in the piece in, in Gaza, and just said, no, we're not going there because I've heard from, you know, my sources, my cousins or other, you know, uh, activists, you know, that part of Gaza is not safe because this has happened. I would not have known. No, it's impossible. I've got, I've think, got my know. desks, you know, foreign desks saying, We've seen on Reuters that this has happened. Can you get down there? Well, how's the desk going to know? I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, the only reason why I don't go and, I, and, I, and I'm able to say to the foreign desk, I'm not going there is because, you know, Riyadh has said, I'm not going it's there. Not so safe. if it's not safe for him. So this piece that I want to sort of show is, um, it was uh, from 2015, 2014. 2014-15, um, and it was um, the largest um, uh, 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 bombardment of Gaza um, after Hamas had fired rockets into Israel by the Israeli uh, uh, for, um, Israeli defense forces. And uh, we'd gone, we'd flown into Israel. I arrived in Tel Aviv, sunny, beautiful, you know, uh, Cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan. Yeah. You might as well have been in sort of, you know, Lisbon or, yeah. you know, somewhere. Uh, you drive the, what, one and a half, two hours down to the border with Gaza and you go across the Eras crossing point, which is this enormous, you know, um, it's kind of like disappearing down Alice, you know, tumbling down the rabbit hole because you go from the first world, you go from sort of, you know, Italy or Spain or, you know, the Mediterranean into, you know, this other world, you know, of, uh, of uh, you know, deprivation, where hospitals are out of fuel. And, and there's, it takes you 15 minutes to cross the sort of border, but um, so you're disgorged. It's almost, uh, it's quite strange, the border crossing. It's, uh, you go, you, you're, you know, checked out, your passport sort of stamped, and you just disappear into this kind of um, series of tunnels and um, uh, monitored sort of... Um, uh, there's no, there's no actual people sort of uh, checking your passport. It's all automated. <laughs> it's, it literally is a sort of rabbit hole, and uh, then you're just disgorged out the other end, and you're in this other world. Other world, sort of, you know, uh, just uh, there's nobody there, and um, there's a bus arrived, and there was a, there was a whole bunch of us, sort of journalists, and we had this, we had this. I think there was an agreement between the uh, authorities in Gaza and the Israelis that. For journalists to be given safe passage, there'd be one uh, um, moment where the journalists who wanted to leave would be transported in two buses that would be monitored by Israeli drones. So they would come. So all the journalists who were leaving Gaza would sort of just get out and just sing, hooray, I'm sort of leaving. And then we'd board the same <laughs> two old buses yes. that they had just left. And we'd sort of have about 15 minutes to sort of swap advice and don't do that and, you know, this is all right and fuel is running low and blah, blah, blah. Don't sleep on, you know, don't take rooms on that side of the hotel because it's slightly sort of exposed. Um, and then you'd get on the bus and these kind of really old sort of rickety buses and then you'd just drive down this, you know, blasted landscape. But the first person to meet us was uh, uh, ITV News's... Um, you know, fixer Riyadh, who was, uh, who's lived in Gaza, who's, you know, been working with us for many years. The thing you have to bear in mind is that fixers can't leave. So, That's what I mean. Know, they're known in the community for what they, they are, do. They are there. You know, they're, yeah. they're in Aleppo, they're in uh, Damascus, they're in wherever they are, you know, uh, and that's their home. That's where their kids grow up. That's where their family is. And, and I think, you know, when you, when you, you know, they work with you, what they're paid by us supports 40 people, you know, maybe, you know, depending, give or take. So, you know, you're very conscious that when you sort of arrive and how many times do we go to Gaza, we go, you know, there's a flare up, we go, 
Um, there's three weeks, four weeks of frenetic activity, maybe a bit more, and then we don't come back for, you know. Five so this is a piece that um, I did. And there's a moment towards the end, which I, I, I what I want to say is why there are guardian angels is that we're, a, the story is pretty self-explanatory. But then later on, um, you'll see a moment where we, we were filming um, the aftermath of a sort of Israeli sort of airstrike and uh, where we had been interviewing someone uh, there was someone who was wounded who was being evacuated. We didn't know, myself uh, uh, and um, uh, Patrick Amara, who was the sort of uh, uh, the um, uh, cameraman, um, we just started filming someone who was wounded. People became very agitated, um, really angry at us. We hadn't realized that actually the person who was being taken up and they, they tried to cover his face was uh, uh, a Palestinian militant. I think he was a member of Islamic Jihad. And they thought we were filming him and they were very worried that if we put that on air, he'd be identified by um, uh, the Israeli sort of uh, military. Um, and they became really, really angry. We didn't know, we just thought it was someone wounded. And it was only, and you'll see him, Riyadh sort of appears into shot, he's in wearing a blue flak jacket and just calms the situation down and explains that we were just filming, we had no idea and so forth. And if he hadn't been there, I really don't know where yes. the situation had gone. Also, just before we go to it, after this clip, I'm gonna take some of your questions. So have a think while we're watching and then we'll put up the lights and, and take some questions. Let's watch. This is the price the people of Rafa paid for the reported capture of the Israeli soldier. There were desperate scenes in one of the city's major hospitals whose wards are already stretched. Outside, people tried to flee to safety amidst the bombardment. It was a ferocious onslaught that ended a ceasefire that barely was, as Israel exacted revenge on Hamas. We arrived in neighboring Khan Yunis as the sound of the attack on Rafa reverberated through the Khazar district. It was an almost apocalyptic scene. This area had been sealed off for three weeks. This morning, people returned hoping they'd be able to recover any belongings they could pick up from the rubble. Instead, they found themselves first having to retrieve the bodies of those that had been killed. Samir al-Najjar fled along with tens of thousands of other residents of Khazar. This is all that remains of three of his family's homes. Seeing Khazar today, he told me, it's as though it's disappeared. The dead are in the streets, the houses have been demolished, even the trees and animals didn't survive the Israeli attack. We made our way further down, within sight of the border with Israel, marked by the concrete barrier walls. Above us, Israeli helicopters fire anti-missile flares. Some wandered through the streets, distraught and traumatized at all they'd lost. 23-year-old Yasser returned to the building where he says he was lucky to escape. I hid in here with around a hundred others, he told me. We tried to contact the Red Cross, but they couldn't reach us, so we took our chance and ran. It was a miracle we survived. Suddenly, people find a wounded Palestinian fighter, not from Hamas, but a local militant group. They tell us not to film his face. A day which had briefly held out the prospect of a ceasefire in Gaza ends with a sense that following the alleged capture of the Israeli soldier, if anything, the conflict here could be set to intensify. Ragi Omar, ITV News, Southern Gaza. So we kept that quite short. I mean, you sort of saw that sort of thing, mostly actually just not for, to identify the, uh, the, the, the fighter, but also just uh, Riyadh. So we didn't want him to sort of, uh, you know, if we'd ran it wrong, long, you know. Yeah, well, what, what the repercussions might be. Mm. Let's pop the lights on for a moment and I'll get uh, some hands. Yes, great. We have some microphones we're going to get to come to you so that we catch you on camera. And I might get you actually to stand up. I think they said it's better as well, just... Uh, for our purposes. Hi, nice to meet you. Who are you? Um, my name's Elle. I'm from Glasgow. Nice I'm to meet you. I'm a yeah. journalism student as well. Um, you must get asked this a lot, being you know somebody that does go into places with such conflict, mm. things like that. 
How do you keep your emotions in check as a journalist when you're yeah. faced with things like that? Mm. No, very good question. I mean, I mean, you know, I do get asked that a lot, but it's very relevant. And it's, uh, it's a question, you know, I ask myself, I'm sure lots of my colleagues ask ourselves lots and lots of times. Um, with difficulty is, is, is the answer because we're, you know, we're human beings. We have... Um, uh, um, uh, you know, we react to things in a very sort of different way, not because of, I think when some people, you know, you ask, you're asked that question, you, you, you're asked it in the sense of answering it politically, you know, how do you feel about Gaza or this or that? It's not so much that, it's sometimes just down to normal human uh, uh, reactions. You know, you're, you're exhausted, you're tired of seeing people, you know, who are in very difficult situations. Um, so uh, the answer is um, you have to remember why you're there. I think that's a, when you do get upset and people sort of, you know, cry or sort of, you know, break down or think that's it, or I'm, you know, I need to be pulled out. I mean, I think you have to sort of remember why am I here? I'm reporting something that's you know, much bigger than me. I think that's the sort of first thing. But ultimately, I think uh, at the beginning of my career, I think uh, there was a, a very unhealthy attitude in journalism whereby, you know, you don't, you know, you carry on and, um, you know, this kind of idea that uh, uh, it was a much more macho uh, uh, environment. I think that's changed uh, for the better. Um, and... Uh, you know, people who do go to uh, conflict zones are given, you know, a lot more sort of support if you don't. And also, I think the other thing is, you know, there used to be a sense in which when you got given an assignment and you said, actually, I don't want to go, right, yeah. that was a kind of almost a sort of conscious decision to sort of, you know, drop into the slow lane. Yeah, or, uh, and maybe you know, afraid you wouldn't be asked afraid again. Afraid you wouldn't be asked again. I think that's, you know, changed considerably, the power to sort of say no. Uh, and I have said no, you know, quite a few times. Um, but the most important thing is actually, uh, I remember actually uh, it was uh, it was Jeremy Bowen who sort of, you know, he 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 reported a lot from uh, the conflict in the Balkans in the 90s, and he was in Sarajevo. He saw the war from one particular side, uh, and there was one day when there was something in particular, you know, uh, um, what became actually. He testified at the war crimes tribunal against Slobodan Milosevic, you know, in the uh, in, in the war crimes, and that report that he did about the um, the bombardment of a civilian market in Sarajevo, in, in predominantly you know Bosnian Muslim sort of area by Serbian forces, was entered into uh, you know a central plank of a war crimes prosecution against the, and I remember him sort of saying, you know, he. You know, it had enough, he'd sort of bawled his eyes, I'd seen horrible things, and he thought, I could either just react that way, this is an outrage, and he said, no one would listen to me. Whereas if I just told this story very methodically and said, this is what I saw, this is the evidence I gathered, this is what this person told me, it became a historically accurate thing to submit. And that's why it ended, what was it, 19 years later? Yeah. In front of the war not that long ago, they remember they were talking about it not that long ago. Absolutely. Right? So uh, I think that's the point. You know that you know whether it's wherever it is in the world. That, you know I could either just say this is me, Raggy and I'm outraged, and this is absolutely appalling. In which case, people will see it as that. Whereas if you say uh, you leave all that, you know, in the edit room, you sort of share that with your colleagues, but then you say, okay, what do we put on air? this is what I saw, this is what happened, this is what X told me, this is what Y told me, this is what the evidence points to. And then it becomes something much more powerful. Great, thank you. One more question here and then we'll continue. This gentleman here, I will take your question afterwards. Let's get the microphone to you, if you don't mind standing up as well. Hi. Yeah. My question is, uh, how does the channels choose the people to go to the crisis area? Mm. Do they say, hey, Raggy, you are from Somalia, you want to go? <laughs> or you say, no. I want to go? Yeah. Right? I have been sent uh, to Ireland uh, a number uh, of times. Exactly. <laughs> uh, a, 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 a bit of both, I think. I mean, um, uh, that's a very, very good question. Um, uh, I mean, look, things have sort of changed a lot uh, from when I entered, where when I was working for the BBC, um, there weren't a lot of people that looked like me who were working, uh, you know, on 
national television in as a foreign correspondent you know thankfully that's you know changing some you know would say not you know awesome. enough but it's 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 headed sort of in the right direction but i think it goes back to you know the democratization of the ability to tell news you know before it was just the bbc it was cnn that was it if you if you if you were living all over the world and you were from whatever you just switched on and it was just bbc world and cnn you know what I just no, no but i was going to say yeah. what i was going to say is because I, I went to al jazeera but that's what really changed things dramatically that suddenly the the barriers to entry for other broadcasters were much lower. You know, technology meant that, you know, lots of other sorts of things could... And I remember sort of um, in 2003, and I was in Iraq, and I worked a lot with Al Jazeera, you know, uh, uh, correspondents, and I was actually in the, uh, in the, um, uh, uh, the sort of um, in Baghdad when the Al Jazeera office was bombed on the other side of the Tigris sort of river. But Al Jazeera sort of changed things completely. And um, suddenly you started having, you know, today you have so many things, TRT and RT World and this and that, which is great. It's fantastic. Um, but I think the fact that people, wherever you are, whether you're in Nairobi or Nouakchott or, you know, Rio de Janeiro or Rochdale, you know, you can switch on the TV and you can get many different versions of what's happening in the world. Puts pressure on people to say, where I, mean, I remember when I joined Al Jazeera English, every single correspondent that Al Jazeera English had in what were the main stories at the time, so it was, you know, Baghdad, Tehran, uh, Johannesburg, Nairobi, because of somebody, all were women who were not, you know, English. And that was 2006. That was 2006, 2007. And I thought, my goodness, you know, and I was working for them. I thought that was an amazing yeah. sort of uh, thing. But of course they had, they spoke different languages, they looked different, they had access, they had, you know. So um, how do people choose? I think that Western broadcasters are competing now with other channels that have other sort of um, uh, perspectives. So I think there's the thing where, you know, you, you can't just sort of arrive, you know, I'm the BBC and you look a certain way that the world was sort of, oh yes, you know, you know, one, you know, everyone has to sort of uh, change. But then after that, I think people have to put themselves forward. The hustle. I think the hustle, and <laughs> also continues. just sort of say, look, yeah. I mean, even in Syria, you know, <laughs> you know, so many of, our, I'm talking specifically for about ITV News, that are, you know, the chief director of news uh, um, for ITV that has won, you know, two RTSs, is uh, you know a, a, a young sort of you know you know Jordanian uh, who works for many different uh, channels you know all over the Middle East. He he you know leads our coverage all over you know uh, the Middle East. You know that would have been unthinkable. You know uh, uh, only a few Number years, years ago. ago yeah. uh, and you know his reports have you know, been entered for sort of, you know, BAFTAs and RTSs, and he is the sort of director of news, and he was before then for Reuters. So that's a sign, you know, uh, that, you know, it's easy in the sort of put someone in front of the camera. What really I think makes a difference is if someone is in charge of the editorial process. Yes. And that's where Lutfi's sort of influence sort of, you know, comes, is sort of said, we shouldn't cover that. Why are we ignoring Libya? You know, why aren't we doing more on et cetera, et cetera? But so. the best people, I, I think, think so. on yeah, camera they, they are the will, ones yeah, that yeah. are really so, producers yeah. in a mm. way that have editorial yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. know-how. But, you know, you talk about Iraq. There are a lot of people would have got to know your face mm, uh, yeah. from Iraq yeah. when you went in 2003. And I think I'll call this section Chance Favours the Prepared Mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing is, it's interesting. I, I, I'd wanted to be a... Uh, a correspondent for a while, and um, I was working at BBC World Service, yeah. uh, you know, uh, a place we know yes, and love very yes. well. Your former um, parish. Exactly. And uh, I'd gone uh, uh, to be what was called then uh, a stringer, which is like you're not a full correspondent, you're you're a correspondent, you're there for the BBC or whoever it is. Um, uh, you get paid a sort of um, a retainer. 
Yeah. But you work as a freelance. Ready, yeah. yeah, you have to yeah. be ready. And so, so you get given enough not to starve and be able to pay your electricity bills. But uh, outside of that, you have to sort of... So I was in Amman in Jordan. And um, at this time, this was at the height of the sort of food for oil deal and Iraq sanctions. And the whole sort of uh, Western media really were concentrating on the sort of years after the... Uh, Israeli-Palestinian peace accords. So everything was focused on sort of, you know, uh, uh, the West Bank and Jerusalem. Um, but I sort of looked to the further sort of east and west you get from, uh, you know, uh, uh, Palestinian territories and, and, and Israel, the more Western interest dies out, or did do back then. So I just thought, well, here's Iraq, and, you know, it's a huge story, and uh, you know, these massive sanctions and the oil for food deal. So I just decided to try and, you know, I thought this is not being covered. It's a big story. I'm gonna, and the BBC was banned at this time in Iraq. Uh, the Iraqis didn't give any visas to BBC people. So I just spent Which can weeks, be a big part of covering big, any exactly, story is getting your visa. Well, I, that's yeah. exactly, I just thought, well, you know, I'm determined I'm gonna get a visa for the BBC. Um, and I was largely working for sort of radio, and of course, I, you know, I was trying to sort of break into TV. So I just, you know, I just, I think the, the Iraqi ambassador in Jordan just kind of got sick and tired of me by the end. I sort of come and visited him so many sort of times. But I think I just, again, I just looked different. I wasn't, you know, what he had expected. So I sort of pestered him, and uh, eventually he said, okay, I'm going to send your, you know, lots of other BBC correspondents come to me. I've, they've applied, and I've just thrown their application in the bin. <laughs> uh, I'll send your application to Baghdad and, you know, I can't say what... So I got in and suddenly all my bosses looked up. Really? You've got a visa? He goes, oh, we must uh, send you a, you know, a, a production team and a, you know, camera. So I went to Iraq really the first time, I mean, like six years before the invasion. So I was going in and out of Iraq for a very, very long time. So by the time the 2003 invasion happened, I was really quite, you know, familiar. Uh, so you had a head start. I had a head start. Um, but this is, you know, some while after and, you know, I'd been going to sort of Baghdad 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7 until the sort of, uh, um, you know, the uh, insurgency or the up, uh, uprising sort of, you know, began and the formation of uh, Al-Qaeda in uh, uh, Iraq. Um, but I went back uh, suddenly, uh, having not been there for two, three years, um, out of the blue, no one had heard of ISIS, you know, at this sort of time, you know, suddenly, you know, in 2014, I think, uh, in the summer, it's the same summer that Gaza was happening, uh, that report, and um, said, uh, you know, this um, predominantly sort of, you know, uh, Sunni, Iraqi sort of, you know, uh, uh, group had captured Mosul, and Mosul I'd known really well going backwards and forwards for many, many years. Uh, and this was a piece I'd flown in literally within about three, four days after ISIS had captured Mosul, and most of the world was saying, who is ISIS, what is ISIS? Mm -hmm. um, I think the point of the story is that, you know, when, when you go to a story like this, you have to sort of remember that, um, you know, uh, every night you'll see, you know, refugees stream across here, refugees are leaving here. You know, refugees are people like everyone in this room, you know, your parents, your siblings, their doctors, journalists, lawyers, you know, uh, you know, petrol pump attendants, whatever. So, um, and it's just really about trying to empathize with people who are just extraordinary things have happened to. And I think that's what news is, wherever you're dealing with. Um, it doesn't have to be as extreme or as far away as something like Mosul. It could be something much more sort of local. You know, if you define what is news, news is something, abs you know, the, the unusual, the extraordinary that's just happened to, you know, communities uh, out of the blue. And it's about telling the story of how they deal with that. And that's, that's all you should see this report as. It could have happened in, you know, just down the road in Bow, you know, uh, as much as it happened There's a couple of scenes well. in it that really struck mm. me. Uh, let's watch together. The border between the Kurdish region and the chaos of northern Iraq is increasingly tense. I went on a heavily armed convoy of Kurdish fighters where local officials were escorting a UN team surveying the area. This is the road heading back towards Mosul, now controlled by ISIS, and we were the only ones on it. After the last checkpoint, and with the troops increasingly wary, we stopped. Hello, Mr. Mayor. 
Raggy Omar from ITV. Okay. How are you? How's the situation now? The ISIS forces cannot come against us, he told me. They are afraid of our Kurdish troops. He said, somewhat unconvincingly, that the area was completely safe, as dozens of guards, guns at the ready, kept watch. We're now only about 10 miles from Mosul city, and this is the road where thousands of refugees still continue to travel as they seek shelter in the Kurdish region just up the road. And they're bringing with them eyewitness accounts of how ISIS militants are wooing Sunni Muslims, playing on their fear and distrust of the Shia-led government of Prime Minister Maliki. They're opening up the streets and they've asked staff in the city's essential services, like electricity and water, to come back to work, this young man told me, promising they'll be paid from their budget. They're trying to win the trust of the people. It's why Sunnis in Mosul last night greeted ISIS like this. They look like adoring fans welcoming a rock star, smartphones at the ready. But this hooded militant was cheered when he promised they would establish an Islamic state. All over the north, ISIS have been looting millions of pounds worth of abandoned Iraqi arms supplied by the West. What was an insurgency guerrilla force now has the trappings of a standing army of a state. Which is why today the Iraqi Air Force bombed what appeared to be their own bases and aircraft hangars in a scorched earth policy. ISIS militants are barely two hours from the capital Baghdad where Shia men have been responding to the government's call to arm themselves and join militia to stop ISIS. Tonight, Iraq is again fragmenting and poised for a renewed nationwide sectarian war. Raghi Omar, ITV News, Erbil. Gosh, quite something. Yeah. And I think, I mean, one scene that really struck me because it's so modern and so off the times is all the smartphones mm. in that yeah. square. Yeah. Um, talk us through a little bit with that piece though. It also goes to Gaza, I think. How do you keep yourself safe? I mean, I was worried for you watching you on the side of the yeah. road as well. Um, well, again, I mean, we, we just, you work with people who are, who, who, who you trust, you know, who, uh, uh, look, I mean, uh, okay, um, we're very lucky with these sort of large organizations that they have a huge amount of sort of infrastructure to be able to sort of um, get us somewhere, give us sort of protection and so forth. After that, if you're in that sort of situation, it really is just down to uh, experience. Also, just not being and not viewing what you do as some kind of adventure. You know, it's a kind of the ability to be scared is a very, very important commodity. Um, and the minute you lose that, I think, in this kind of uh, uh, assignment, um, you're really uh, in danger. You know, if you sort of think, I'm gonna, you know, carry on. Were you on. scared during that? Definitely, yeah, no, I mean, um, uh, definitely. And I just, uh, and so was the cameraman, <laughs> so was the producer. Yeah, so, yeah rightly uh, so. We all were, and, um, and um, you make a sort of, you know, uh, a judgment Call, but also I think you also have to really observe what people around you are doing. The fact that these soldiers and were nervous. Well, no, the mayor being nervous well, the mayor, made me that nervous. Was, well, that yeah. but just said, look, I don't care. They might play. They might carry on down the road, but we're not. So I think you have to um, trust to the um, the knowledge of other people that you know, uh, and just being aware that what your what your foreign desk or editors are saying is in some ways the least important. Mm. I think just, you know, looking around people who are very, very sort of, you know, nervous, um, and also just little things, you know, you're in a village, you know, why aren't, why are the streets empty? Why aren't people in the marketplace? Why aren't, you know, all those things that you'd expect normal, those are telltale, and you, that, that comes, Which comes with from sort experience. of experience. You sort of think something isn't right here, you know, if, if it was such a sort of, you know, glorious day for the regime, why are people out celebrating or why are, so those sort of things are sort of telltale signs. So how do you keep yourself, it's, it's, there's many different layers to it. Um, and, um, you know, far too many journalists uh, around the world, most of them, I have to say, um, journalists based in the countries in which we're reporting, they're the ones who, when you look on sort of roll yes. call every year, 
they are the ones who sort of far more often and proportionate are in harm's way than, than, than international you know, correspondents. Um, but it's that old adage, isn't it? You know, don't, you know, don't die for the story. You know, if it really doesn't feel, and, I, and, I, and I'm lucky enough to sort of have been experienced to say, I don't feel good about this, you know, and I won't go. So, and I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah, so kind of being able to mm, trust your instincts, yeah, I suppose, yeah. which is yeah. with experience that yeah. has been honed. Also, the other thing is, uh, the point you made about the sort of smartphones is very indicative because so much of what we report now is not reliance on you having to be on the front line. There's so much what we call, we call it, you know, euphemistically, user-generated content. Mm. Where Fact did is, you get that from? We got that from... <laughs> We, we made contact with a local journalist in Mosul who we, someone uh, at ITV News had worked with about three years earlier. Uh, we had his phone number, the producer was in London. It was, it was June, so it was like, yeah. you know, so people were on holiday. Yeah. So I, we called Jonathan, he said, look, uh, I'm not in work today. Um, and we said, you look, you were the last person in Mosul. Uh, there was a guy you worked with. I said, let me look up his number. And Jonathan was at home uh, about to sort of go on a holiday. He, I can't remember this journalist's name. His, he still miraculously had the phone number, got in touch with that uh, journalist in Mosul. Are you there? Yes. Is it possible to sort of operate? How is it? He said, it's fine. Everyone's really happy that ISIS has come in. I said, what, really? Um, and he said, are you able to record it? Do you have a camera? Because, and here's the, the, the fast moving sort of sense of technology. When Jonathan worked with him, the only way to get anything out was to have a sort of actual. Uh, an actual camera. So we were thinking, how is he going to ingest the tape? And, you know, Sandy said, oh no, don't worry, the internet's working here. I can go and record on my smartphone. So within, that was literally four hours of, you know, someone contacting Jonathan Wald, uh, getting in touch with this uh, producer him going out, recording the scene, and then just sending it wow. as a video file. I have a thought. And then it got, it got sent to London, yeah. and then London sent it back to us in Air Bill, and we were only about 30 miles away from him. Uh, so he went and did all the sort of rounds, and then we edited in our piece. So I, that's exactly how it, that happened. I think it's really illustrative, actually. But also, it, it, so when you talk about the danger, Yeah. In fact, in some ways, it sort of is what I was saying earlier about sort of, you know, technology and, you know, the democratization of sort of... Uh, I remember being in, in Lebanon in 2006 uh, when uh, Israel bombarded southern Lebanon. And there was a colleague from an American network, CBS, who's based here. Um, and um, we'd all been sort of so used... And Al Jazeera English had only just sort of launched. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Al Jazeera English, of course, had been going for you know quite a while, and of course had had spawned many sort of imitators in in in, in the Arab speaking world of other satellite sort of channels. But Al Jazeera was a sort of benchmark still, uh, Al Jazeera Arabic. And um, so this friend of mine went to southern Lebanon in a town, a village that had been you know heavily bombarded, uh, and they started filming. And of course. It was in the south of Lebanon. It was predominantly sort of Shia sort of uh, um, and sort of therefore pro Hezbollah sort of uh, village. And there was a lot of antipathy to Western, you know, media, thinking that most, you know, the, the, you know, the West was, you know, uh, you know biased towards uh, Israel. So this colleague who is British but working for an American network started filming and people came out and, what are you filming? And not initially hostile but wary. Where are you from? And, uh, you know, obviously some of his colleagues were American and you don't tell the truth, you know, you don't tell the truth about what's happening to us. And, and, um, and uh, this friend of mine said, no, we're going to report what we see absolutely sort of accurately. And then literally the person he was speaking to goes, that's not true. You know, I have a cousin who lives in wherever it was, Delaware. Yeah who, you know, told me, you know, what CBS was reporting last night. And, and it was just literally, it came back. Straight out of Straight out. Whereas a few years ago, who would have, <laughs> how, who, how would, you know, a yeah. village, and it could have been anywhere, Sri Lanka or... Yeah, 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 so, hyper-connected. Exactly.
Um, I know you'll want to ask some questions, so let's go to our next clip. We're going to stay in the region. We're going to get into some yeah, more. Yeah, Fred is sort of um, very Middle East dominated. Yeah, which is... Yeah. Which, you know, continues mm. to make headlines now, even mm. when you were talking about, I know it was Kurdish Iraq, mm. but you know, the whole issue with mm. uh, Syria, Northern Syria and Kurdish and Turkey and, yeah, you know, that yeah. the geopolitics continues. But we're going to take a look at Iran. This I found fascinating, mm. I have to say, and I'm also curious as um, if they saw you as British yeah. uh, when you're reporting and you're going... I suppose that's the, the, the nice thing. I'm going to be able to inhabit different worlds. Um, so, and again, I sort of went to Iran for the first time in 2004. Five, and I have to say, I found it the most sort of, in terms of, of that region, yes. the wider Middle East, they, the Iranians get very, on wherever side of the political fence they sort of sit, you know, very, very, um, uh, there's a particularly sort of Iranians, they might sort of say Persian thing of sort of being seen as part of the Middle East. We're not, we're separate, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very, um, probably the one of the most misunderstood societies and sort of countries, and it has a very monolithic uh, representation here in this country, most sort of West, but it's, um, I found it to be the place where the most interesting changes and challenges and dichotomies uh, in the wider sort of Middle East are going on, and they have been for, for really a long sort of time from, the, you know, um, Khatami years, then Ahmadinejad, you know, to now and the nuclear deal. There's a huge swirling, bubbling middle of sort of uh, Iran that we just don't get. And what we see is, you know, the mullahs and Friday prayers and the hardliners. But uh, it's an extraordinarily diverse, quixotic, you know, mixed. So. But the thing is, it's difficult to put all that in two minutes. Two minutes. You're, you're, you're in Iran, we've got the nuclear deal, you know, uh, you know, Trump's against it, is it going to survive, and do they want to kill us? You know, that's what... <laughs> um, wow, okay, well, I'm, you, know, I'm, you know, it's not like that. So you look for little um, uh, visual motifs that try to challenge audiences back home who might be watching the news who may not be interested in what you're saying, who are waiting for the football or the weather, or whatever it is, you know, that's just the reality of when you, when you watch the news. How can I just give them a tiny little bit of something that there's a little bit different here? So, you know, the, the, the completely obvious thing that you do when you go to Iran, if you want to sort of present the hard life thing, is you go to Friday prayers at the sort of the main mosque where all the hardliners speak and it's, you know, no one there is under 55 years old. And they're all men and they're sort of chanting death to America. But then quite close by, we just found this other sort of scene that told us completely different sort of story. So this is about that journalism should be there also to challenge orthodoxies, or at least just try to say, is there some other narrative to the orthodoxy? That's there, let's watch. <clears throat> A street party in Tehran and everyone's invited. Not exactly what most people would associate with the capital of the Islamic Republic of Iran. It's the eve of a major holiday and free food is on offer to whoever wants it. Iran is a bewitching mix of contradictions, where the modern, the sophisticated and outward looking sit side by side with the religious, conservative and suspicious instincts of a government at odds with the West for nearly 40 years. And those two very differing views is at the heart of a division in Iran over the nuclear deal with world powers. I asked Fuad Izadi, an expert on Iran's relations with the West, which of these viewpoints was in the ascendancy. People who are in the government and also a majority of people who are in Iran's parliament actually want to turn the page in terms of Iran's foreign policy. They want to have a normal relations with the countries that Historically, the Islamic Republic has had difficulties with. And if the other side does not take advantage of this window of opportunity... A much more conservative and hardline figure could emerge. Yes. And Friday prayers is where you see that conservative, hardline aspect of Iranian political life. This is as much a political occasion as it is a religious ceremony. It's a gathering of those Iranians who have long been skeptical and wary of closer ties with the West and completely opposed to giving up the nation's nuclear program. Mohammad Reza Taragi is a member of Iran's hardline Islamic coalition party. 
As our Supreme Leader said, this agreement is accepted but only under certain conditions, and we want to retain our civilian nuclear industry without letting America and its allies spread their influence in Iran. The sermon was delivered by a senior cleric, and everywhere you looked there was defiance. Amongst the senior officials present was the head of the Revolutionary Guard, Muhammad Ali Jafari. Although the nuclear deal was signed three months ago, it's only received the approval of the Iranian leadership this week, but with heavy conditions. Iran now has to start dismantling its centrifuges and exporting the uranium it's enriched in return for the lifting of sanctions. Iran's supreme leader may have given his conditional backing to the nuclear deal, but the political rhetoric on show here during Friday prayers has been uncompromising. And as people poured out from the prayers, many let their feelings towards the West clear. Death to America, death to Britain. The nuclear deal between Iran and world powers now enters its most testing phase to date. And for those for and against it, the stakes could not be higher. Ragi Omar, News at 10, Tehran. Amazing visuals in that. Right, let's put the lights up and let's get some questions. Uh, this gentleman over here, just give you one moment if you don't mind standing up. Hi. Who are you? Hello there. Uh, Hi. James from Birmingham City University. Um, my question is essentially is kind of what motivates you? You go to these places mm. that are so critical and you risk your life. You talk about Riyadh and they're there. They say death to, <laughs> yeah. death to Great Britain. Yeah. You go over there, you risk, your, you risk your life. What motivates you? Well, first of all, what I'd say is it's, a, it's true. They sort of say death to Britain, death to America. But the thing is, uh, you learn that in these countries that you go to, they... Uh, you have to give them, you know, the benefit that they can distinguish between the individual and the government. And I've been to, most of the things that interest me are going to places that are most, countries that are most at odds with Western liberal ideals and democracies, that they, they see it as a threat to their way of life, their independence, their culture. That, that interests me. Why is it that we just presume that, you know, Western liberal democracy is just a no-brainer, you know, uh, you know, capitalism, uh, open markets, you know, Western liberal democracy is, you know, there's, no, there's nothing else. We, you know, we, 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 you know, we spent 600 years experimenting, nothing. Well, there's a lot of people that regard it as an existential sort of threat. I would like to sort of know why. But when you go there, they can just say, I hate everything about your country. I really want to sort of see it sort of fail. And, you know, uh, but they're, they're incredibly friendly towards you. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, that's almost invariably been, 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 the, been the way. I mean, whether I'm in, you know, dining with the Taliban or whatever else, you know, bizarrely, you end up in these sort of philosophical the debates. Uh, so, um, and it really struck me in Iraq when um, in 2003, that uh, we were in a hospital, there was a doctor who'd been working two days and two nights. He'd been treating this girl that had been very badly burnt. He was very tired, very emotional. Uh, and, uh, you know, here was this girl probably killed by a, uh, not killed, I mean, you know, injured by a bomb dropped by a British or American plane, and uh, I would just happen to be near the bed nearest to him and with a microphone, and he said, he looked, you know, very, very sort of, as though he's about to sort of, you know, blow up, and he said, he looked at me, he said, where are you from? I thought, okay, you know, you telltale signs, this guy's about to sort of really just explode, you know, he's been treating this girl, and, and I said, I'm from Britain, and he looked at me and he said, uh, you're welcome. And they started then talking. So, so people don't, they can, you know, they might, in the same way with us, I mean, you know, you know, you might have a very strong disagreement or, you know, whatever, you know, a view point to another country. But if someone from that country is here in this room and wants to talk to you about it, you're not going to start, you know, spitting at them and slapping them around. So you can distinguish between the individual and the government. What motivates me, I think the thing about journalism, any branch of journalism, and not just this, is that it's the chance of a continual education. I think that's what motivates me. You know, there's always something, you know, people sort of say, what's the best story you've ever worked on? And my sort of cliched view is that the best story is yet to come. You know, I think that's one of the sort of things. There's always, you know, I didn't, there was a time where I knew nothing about Iraq. You know, I didn't know anything about it. And it's that wonderful thing of discovering, you know, a country and, you know, it's, you know, uh, everything that it has to offer, it's kind of, uh, it's uh, annoying, agonizing, difficult, you know, um, problematic uh, complexities. 
um, as well as sort of, you know, the people that you meet who educate you about it, you know, other, you know, journalists, writers, uh, you know, musicians, whatever it is. So, so I think what motivates me is that journalism is the one thing where you can sort of think, wow, you know, next month I might be working on something completely sort of uh, different. I mean, uh, I don't know if my friends working on Brexit would say that. But I think they're kind of <laughs> they're ready to they're ready to sort of uh, evacuate themselves from that <laughs> particular story. But on the whole, there's always a, a, a big story that's really, really. Uh, Interesting. I give you a laugh. I had uh, one of our political correspondents. Mm. I bumped into him in the canteen in the BBC, and I was like, "Oh, enjoying the reports." He's like, "This story will be here after we're dead." <laughs> so <laughs> that gives sorry. you an idea of the length of Brexit. Well, another wonderful thing about being a journalist is that I get to interview people like oh, Maggie Omar. Kind. Exactly, well, you get to do well, all sorts. You, I think I need to wrap it at this time. Yeah. Thank you all for coming, thank and you, hope you Nilla. all thank enjoyed. You no, wonderful to have you.